going on, everyone? It is time for another edition of One on One with John Alba here on adfreeshows.com and AFS on YouTube.com. We come to you every single Thursday here on Ad Free Shows, trying to take you all across the pro wrestling spectrum with interviews from everywhere. I mean, recently we had an interview with AW Music Production Coordinator Mikey Ruckus. That was one of my favorites. We've talked to Daniel Garcia. We've talked to Willow Nightingale, Ashley Vox, and today... Oh, today, Cabas y Caballeros, we are joined by none other than my personal favorite ring announcer, Mr. Ricardo Rodriguez. What is going on, my man? Happy holidays to Buenos you. Buenos dias, damas y caballeros. Yo soy su servidor, Ricardo Rodriguez. Oh. We, we, we need to give a little bit of a off, oh, right? That was, we could end the interview now. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, pay me, pay me. <laughs> like, 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 I'm good, man. No, that was awesome. Uh, hey, man, I really appreciate your time here. I know it's a busy time of the year, but we, we love just digging into the best of yesteryear here on one on one. And when I think of uh, people who leave an impact on the industry for being unique, you are certainly one of them. And your journey is a really cool one to talk about, too. So how, how have you been lately? How have things been going for you? Uh, pretty good. I mean, like, like we've discussed in the, you know, off, off of the, before we went on, um, I was on my way to Egypt and then there was a lot of like travel issues. So instead of, and then with the COVID testing and whatever, and then how long it took to get the test it messed with the flight. Um, and then to get another one, because right now with all the flights going on, all the clinics are swamped. So to get the results, you know, it would have taken me cause I was in Boston. It would have taken me an extra two days. And then I, just, I was just like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to go home and I'll just wait until after the holidays to go back to Egypt. So you're living in Egypt now. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize. Like I've been following you on social media, so I'm, I'm keen to that. But what brought you out to Egypt? So I'm currently in San Antonio. That's where uh, my residence is. But yeah, I, I, I live in Egypt. Um, I've been there for a year already, a little over a year, uh, uh, 13 months. And um I, there's a backstory to how it happened and it all kind of stemmed from living in India. Um, when I lived in India, I opened up a, an academy uh, alongside the great Kali. Um, and and I, I think we had a great success there. Eventually, so I mean, so much that like WWE and Impact went after it. And, you know, we saw like the, the, the WWE India spectacle show that they had, and it's all stemming from that. Um, so after, after that, you know, I came back to the US, I went to England, I went to a couple of different countries, long, you know, long stays. And then when COVID happened, um, it shut everything down. It totally shut everything down. And I know I'm not the only one that, that, that felt this way of, I was without wrestling because that's been my, my income for the last, what, 10 12 years um so those that when, when COVID happened i was like I, I don't know what to do i'm like I, i'm going crazy um and then after about a year of COVID, eventually you know i got this call from from this guy named walid fathi um in, in egypt and basically uh asking me if i wanted to go and then redo what i did in india um so that's what led me uh last november last november of uh 2020 uh to head out to egypt so i've been over there for about a year already how difficult is it to start something like that up in a territory that i don't think most people look to egypt for building the next generation of pro wrestling talent i mean in the most respectful way possible but it it was crazy because it's the same thing in, in india and india was different because i had I had Kali there and he like set up the whole process. He set up the whole thing. He already knew like what he wanted. He set up the dojo. It wasn't the best of, of living conditions, but um, but at least we had a ring. We had, you know, the the, the key elements um, and all he needed, he just needed somebody to teach him. And I was like, cool, I'm there. And I got it. I, I have, I have the utensils um, needed. And then, so it was a lot easier. Uh, but in Egypt, it was a whole different animal because it, it was f- straight from scratch. We, we built a ring. We we um, we had to develop the process. We had to educate the kids of how to do it because they weren't pre-accustomed or pre. They 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 weren't ready up for me like how India was. Um, so it was a whole different process. It was a little tougher, 
And also, COVID was still, is still around. So that slow, has slowed down so many things. We, in my head, I had a plan of where I wanted to be at a certain point. Uh, because in India, I did everything in six months. Um, and in Egypt, I've been there for about a year. And we're st- I'm still not close to where I want to be because of COVID. So it what? definitely slowed down the whole thing. Why is it important to you to expand the spheres of influence of wrestling to areas that may not have as easy access to a mainstream training process like India or like Egypt? When and, and it, it, I'm always going to kind of use India as my my reference because I learned so much there, and um, being in India, where there was no wrestling at all, there it didn't exist. Uh, or the only thing, the only way that they, they knew about it was what they saw on TV. Um, what I learned in in India, and it's also what I learned in Egypt, was because they don't have any other option. That's the only place that they have. They are so passionate about it. Um, they work hard. They realize how much their parents are are sacrificing to pay to send them to this wrestling school. Um, so they put in the effort. Here in the States and you know, in Mexico and Canada and in the UK and Australia, Japan, where they, they where it's and there's an abundance, we are kind of spoiled to it. Where if it's if it's like, oh, I don't like this school, I'll go to this one. Um, or like, well, I don't need this guy, I can just you know do my own thing or whatever. Um in, in India and in Egypt, it's, it was different because it, they're hungry. It doesn't exist over there. So, so they appreciate a lot more and they put in the effort and uh, they trust me a lot more. So that's also like a, a, something I have to carry with myself. Um, but I, I, I loved it and I learned so much being there that you can see the, the hunger. You can see that, that, that they want this. Um, and in, in, in India's case, I've already seen it pay off. You know, I have several students that are already signed. I have several students that are, are constantly being asked whenever they do the trials in Dubai um, or Abu Dhabi, where I would Dubai, I think it's Dubai when they do them. Um, I see some of my students at these trials and I'm so happy for them because they never in a million years would they ever, they ever thought that, um, that these kids would ever be in a WWE ring or in, in, in some cases an impact ring. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that. And, and it, it was a long process, but that's kind of what I want to build in Egypt. And once I'm done in Egypt, if something happens elsewhere, I would definitely jump on it. Um, because I would like to, to have each individual country stamp their flag, uh, plant their flag on, on the world of wrestling. Why is it something that's important to you to do that? Because you, you obviously traveled around the world as a performer, and doing that. And we hear all these rich stories over the years of, oh man, there was nothing like performing in Japan. There's nothing like performing in Mexico. So why sure, is it sure, so sure. fulfilling for you to have that influence coming from all these different countries? Uh, also, side note, I tend to jump around a lot, but I always bring it back. That's so okay. Bear with me. Full circle bear with storytelling me. here. I want to yeah, yeah. So, so it's like one of those, yeah, it's one of those like, like European movies where like you have all these stories going on, but they all meet. <laughs> it's kind of like in Snatch. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, um, for me, I've, I've always had this, this dream as a kid that I'm going to change the world. How, I don't know. I'm either going to change it or I'm going to blow it up. One of those two. Um, and, and I, I realized when in WWE, what I was doing backstage of helping out, you know, with like the, um, the, the I want, I don't want to say like producing, but I was helping out, um, Certain guys that they wanted more ring time, you know, I would help them out. Sometimes I would go down to to NXT or FCW, uh, just because, and then they would ask me to help out. And then I started developing that love for you know behind the scenes, and and um, and I started taking the training uh, aspect a lot more seriously. And we we all have different different diff- definitions of what making it is. Um, for some folks, like you said, you know, Japan, you know, the uh, wrestling of Japan, which, yes, I, I would still love to. I've never been there and I would still love to. Um, but I started seeing some of my influences on people that I showed it to. Uh, and, and when I see them do it on TV, it makes me smile because as I get older, I realize, hey, my body is not going to last this much longer. So I have to find a way to stay in it somehow, whether, you know, in some cases, even now it's commentating or what I do now is teaching. And um, 
I, I guess ultimately the ultimate answer is to leave my mark in wrestling so that um, uh, I'll remember in a way, I guess, even though it, it may not be like remember uh, to, to like the average fan, to the wrestlers, uh, to the people within the business, um, when they see, oh, hey, this guy's coming from Egypt. Oh, was he trained by Ricardo? Oh, he's coming from India. Oh, was he trained by Ricardo? Oh, he's coming from X school. Oh, he was with, from, he's one of the Ricardo's kids. That, because I, I, I get that every now and then. Uh, I'll get a message from, you know, something's AEW or whatever, or even, you know, some, some guys, some guys from like, and they'll be like, hey, is this one of your kids? And I was like, yeah. Or, you know, no, it's, you know, da, 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 so I'll pass it on to whoever taught, trained them. Um, but the thought that, that, that I'm being thought of when, when that happens, it's, it makes me smile. I really think you're one of the, what would be the unknighted heroes of his era, because you you were in WWE and, and that mainstream side of things for not a super long period of time, but you contributed in so many different ways at a young age, too, when you were brought in from that. And a lot of people aren't super familiar with your background as a worker, but you were trained and you were working before you got the FCW deal. You're working in FCW a little bit as well. How difficult of a transition was it for you to go from I want to be a wrestler to how can I help out in any role that will get me on TV and help others? The, the hardest part wasn't necessarily the, the actual part of doing it. The hardest part was accepting. That was the hardest part because I was, I, I was a wrestler and then I was brought in to be, and I, and I was a serious wrestler. And then I was brought in to be a talker and a comedic role. And I was, that, that took me, that was the hardest part to accept that, to just kind of like, go, all right, well, this is my ticket. Fuck it. Excuse me. Uh, That's I, okay. You're good. You're good. Uh, all right. Well, fuck it. Uh, might as well, you know, ride the wave. But that was the hardest part of accepting it. Because um, I had these constant battles within myself. And even now, I still have them. Because um, I, I know people know me as Ricardo. And I know, and I get, and they, believe me, that takes me even now a long time to get it. Whenever, like, I contact promoters. Because even now, I still get it. Like, oh, I didn't know you were a wrestler. And I'm like, fuck, man. Like, I trained your champion. <laughs> uh, or I wrestled your champion. <laughs> um but uh, but that was like the hardest part of just accepting. Um, Did you take it personally that they wanted you in a different role? At the time, not to say personally, no. I was at the time I was hoping it was a transition um, because I, uh, I, I figured, hey, it's my way inside the door. And then once I'm in the door, I'm just going to do my own thing. And then hopefully, you know, work my way to the ring, which I did. But as Ricardo, and then even then, I still every now and then I will get put in as in a, a locale or uh, on the house shows or on the European tours, uh, on the dark matches. Uh, but it wasn't me being me. It was you know, hey, this is your position. Help them out. You know, have these guys help them out. They're coming in from FCW. They're coming in from NXT. Help them out. Um, so there, it was very rare when I got the the the, the chance for to for me to be me. I'm not saying I was like some great technical magician in, in the ring, but I thought I was okay. No, you you absolutely were a, a very strong worker, especially in that time where WWE was filled with a lot of characters and, and you were in there and, and you had a chance to do your role. And, you know, I've got my show here on Ad Free Shows Up for Debate where we were just did Bobby the Brain Heenan versus Paul Heyman. And yeah. one of the things that made Bobby Heenan so great is that, you know, he was a non-wrestler, but he could go in there and work. Right. Like yeah. this guy oh, yeah, knew yeah, how yeah. to bump. He, he knew how to do stuff. And that accentuated the stories that he was telling. I feel like there's somewhat of a correlation with you there where you were able to help push stories forward because you knew how to work and, and it made it more believable and entertaining in that sense. I, I know. I know once they found out that I, they knew how to wrestle, that I wrestled because um, when I did my tryouts, only a very select few were there. Um and because it was an actual actual tryout it was at the staples center december like 10th oh, i'm sorry august 10th uh, it was like the day after SummerSlam at the staples center in, in la and uh i want to say if, I, if i'm mistaken i'm sorry it was uh i want to say um tj wilson uh matt seidel and jamie noble were the only ones there um so those are the only three that knew that i wrestled those guys can work all right themselves oh, yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but those three were the only ones that i knew that that they knew ahead of time that i wrestled you know once i got right. signed so like for those those couple of weeks that uh or like a week or two um 
that, that we started with the whole Alberto and Ricardo thing. Um, you know, I, that nobody knew that I wrestled. Um, so then I took like my first 619 from Ray and then that we get to the back and they're like, oh, you took that really well, you know, da, 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 da. they were praising me. And then, but in my head, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I know how to take, I've taken it before, not from Ray, but I've taken the 619 before. Um, but, and then with time, once he found out that, hey, this guy can bump, this guy can do this, they, that's when he started putting me in more bigger spots, uh, which led eventually to like the ladder spots and the rumble spots and da, 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 you know? Um, oh, and we're going to talk about those, believe oh, me. Yeah. Are. And, and, yeah. but, but it's, it's so interesting that you say like, I'm, I'm brought in in this comedy spot, this non-wrestling role, and you weren't really sure what to make of it. And it's something I've gone through too, working on the indies where like, I think when you break into the indies as like a manager, you're thinking like, oh, I need to be this bad guy manager who wears suits. Yeah, I yeah. carry a cane, hit people over the head with it. I'm yeah, just going to yeah, be yeah. a bad guy. But over the years, I've learned like, there is a fun, entertaining element of it where if you're more of like a self-aware character that you're in on the gag, you're in on the comedy. That is self- an important part. That's yeah, self-awareness. Self-awareness. self-awareness is, so no, how, spot. how did self-awareness play into you improving in your role as the personal ring announcer slash manager slash talking piece with, with uh, Alberto Del Rio? Well, obviously, like a, a lot of like in, in going into that self-awareness thing, but like I said, they took me a very long time. Not a long time, but it took me a while to accept it. That was the, the hard part of accepting my, what my spot was and what my role was. Uh, as Rob says, know your role. Um, but when that comes along and you realize, okay, Ricardo's not a wrestler, Ricardo's not a wrestler, so don't bump like a wrestler. Don't take the hits like a wrestler. You know, how would, you know, and I would use Heenan. Um, I, would, I would watch like some, some like movies where they were like hit like some uh, civilian and how they would fall versus you know, like I, I can't fall like the, the action heroes because I'm not an action hero. I'm a civilian. Um, so I have to fall like a civilian. I have to act like a civilian. Um, so that, that's, that was the hardest part, like I said, just accepting it. But, but it, I, I think pretending not to know how to work was, was crucial, uh, was important. Um, but it made it more fun eventually. Like once, once I accepted it, it just became fun. And that's like, exactly what it. I was going to say. And, and Ricky Steamboat told me once, I, I drop a lot of names. Uh, <laughs> Ricky Steamboat told me once, he's like, you're, you're only on TV for like five seconds, but you make those five seconds yours. Yeah. And then I, I kept that in my head. Um, well, so it's, really, it's, yeah. it's once you embrace the ridiculousness of pro wrestling and you understand, okay, this is my role. This is my job. And I'm just going to go out there and do it with everything that I can. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that I find performers can become very endearing to the fans. And I feel like that's exactly what happened with you. I I would like to think so. I, um, because even though I I was heel, uh, I think the Ricardo character kind of, uh, connected with the crowd. And also helped out that I had an awesome heel with with Alberto because how he would treat me. So it it, it was a two parter. I couldn't have done it by myself at all. It was a two piece. Um, so like he was a Christmas tree, I was just like the decoration. Uh, <laughs> but it was different. It was different. Like you see so many managers in wrestling. Like I just said, they fit this like cookie cutter. Like this is what you are. And the personal ring announcer allows you to do so many different things with it as well. And I feel like that was so unique to you guys and it allowed you to take things to another level. How do you feel that it accentuated the Alberto Del Rio character? I think it, it, it like I said, he was a Christmas tree. I was a decoration. That's what I, that's the only way I can describe it at the moment. Um, uh, I, I think him using me, as like the shield, you know, to get away as, you know, like anytime like something would happen, he would grab me and throw me in front of the, the other person or or using me as like the the the, the beating ram or whatever. Uh, it helped his side as well. And like I said, it's a two piece of so like, um, I couldn't have done it by myself. I needed, I needed him. Uh, and then perfect example is when I was with RVD, it wasn't the same um, because RVD is a whole different character. So I needed like somebody strong like Alberto for, for that. Um, and it was all progressive too. It wasn't just from the beginning, it was progressive. Uh, like for example, when I first started doing the re-announcing, I would just re-announce and then get out and then stay away. And then eventually they started letting me be by, by the ring, but by the announce table. 
And then eventually, as time went on, they started letting me be around the ring. And then they started letting me get involved. Um, so it was a progressive little thing. When did you first realize that, okay, there's legs to this act? Um, I think the very, <laughs> oh man. When uh, we got, our uh, first story line was with Ray, was with Ray. And everything that would happen to have like Alberto go, get away was me getting attacked by Ray. And then I was a huge Ray Mysterio fan, huge, massive. We all were. Um, so I was like, this is kind of cool. This is fun. This is awesome. Uh, and then our second one was with Edge. So we went from Ray to Edge. And then it was the same thing. I was like, God, oh, this is awesome. I'm just going to get beat up. I'm going to take all the finishers in WWE. Uh, and I don't have to do like any matches. So, uh, yeah, so I started keeping a checklist of all the all the finishers I was taking in my, you know, like I, I don't have any more, but I had a notebook. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the small ones. Um, so I had a checklist of how many like finishers I took that night by who, and I had like a date. So it was like my own little personal like yeah like little checklist thing. It was it was kind of cool, but um, but yeah like like I said just I go in I don't do any much of anything I get paid, um, which that became kind of nice, and and then that was it. So yeah it was it was rather quick. But like being part of an act that finds legs and finds success like that all of a sudden you go from one level to a whole nother very quickly and i think of it i, I mean i was there madison square garden survivor series 2011 mm -hmm. you're there in one of the main events and yeah. because of you being the side piece alberto del rio they brought howard they bring howard finkel in yeah and it's because of you in this indirect roundabout way it yeah. at the world's most famous arena where howard finkel made his name I mean, how special is something like that? You have, man, that was, I, I'm a huge mark. I'm a huge, huge mark, especially for moments like that. Uh, I actually have a picture of myself, Justin Roberts and, and, um, and Howard. I'll send it to you later. Um, but we're backstage and that to me is like, I, ha I don't have it here, but I have it uh, printed and I have it framed because um, it's Howard. You know, it's, it's Howard. It's Madison Square Garden. It's Survivor Series. It's awesome. And also, that was the beginning of CM Punk's, you know, 400 and whatever day Reina was. Um, so it was a special moment, man. It was, yeah, it was cool. Did you ever watch Howard growing up? Like, and you're obviously he's very important to you, but when you're finding out you're going to be doing this ring announcing role. Did you watch other people like the Fink or Tony Chimmel or anyone like that? I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't watch American wrestling until like 2002. Okay. That's when I started watching American wrestling. All I knew was Lucha Libre. Okay. Um, it wasn't until like around 2000, 2002, whatever WrestleMania 17 was. That was 2001. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, WrestleMania 17 was like my first real like WWE paper that I actually went and I enjoyed because at the time, I was just kind of like a lot of like non-wrestling fans. I was like, no, that's kind of, that's whack. That's not real wrestling. That's, that's fake. But then I saw, I saw that, um, that ladder match, the TLC match. And then it was that spot. Yeah. It was at that spot with Edge and, and Jeff Hardy, um, where Edge speared him off the, off of the, where Jeff was hanging from the titles and then Edge speared him. And that was, I was that was just, I was like, what the fuck? This is awesome. This is cool. And then I just became a fan instantly after that. So you're in uh, person for that? You saw that live? Yeah. No, 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 oh, okay. was, no, no. I was, it was at a paper at, um, at a friend's house. We had gotcha. the, the black box. We saw oh, yeah. the black box. Oh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you see that? The, the Unicron like... is not going to know what that is. But... <laughs> no, I, I remember exactly what you're talking yeah. about. But So that's your big bang moment. And that's yeah. like, I, I, American wrestling does it for me. W what yeah. made you get into Lucha Libre? Oh, when I was a kid, you know, being Mexican, that's, that's, you know. I, I I didn't learn English so much later, so all I watched was Spanish TV when I was a, when I was a kid, and we would have you know El Consejo Triple Hour, my favorite was, um, and then living down in Mexico in Mexico when I was a kid, um, you know, lucha, it was, if it wasn't lucha libre, it was it was soccer that was on TV that we were watching. So uh, yeah, so I I grew up watching you know like Atlantis, Octagon, Ultimo Dragon, um, uh, Máscara Sagrada. Ultima, yeah, Ultimo Dragon. Uh, who was who's another one I used to watch? Super Muñeco was a fan. I was a fan of even Conan. Um, so that's that's who I used to watch when I was a kid, and that's all I knew. El San, some of some of El Santo stuff, or Rico El Santo. So when 
you get this call that this is what you're going to be doing. Who is the one that made the call, or at least to your knowledge, made the call to make you the personal ring announcer? And how did that whole chain of events unfold? So it all back, it all went back uh, like a month or two prior. I was doing a wrestling show for this guy named Jesse Hernandez um, for a company called EWF. And um, I finished the match. I get to the back and then he comes up to me. And he's like, hey, you know what? Uh, WWE's coming to town. And mind you, I didn't really watch WWE at the time um, because of work and whatever. Just I just didn't watch wrestling. Um, so he's like, hey, WWE's coming to town. They're they're looking for luchadors. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, of course. Um, he's like, all right, I'll I'll let you know like in a, in a couple of days. I was like, cool. Um, so then I get an email uh, from this guy named Canyon Seaman. Uh, yeah, Canyon. And uh, he gave me all the details and whatever. And so that's when I, yeah, this is like June, July. This is like July. So we did our tryout, whatever day after summer it was, um, 2010. And I do the tryout. It was like, say it was an actual like wrestling tryout. It wasn't like at the PC where you do, you know, all the conditioning drills. It was wrestling. So then I, I get pulled aside after the whole tryout by uh, Kane Seaman. And he's like, hey, um, are you under contract anywhere? Or I was like, no. Um, he's like, um, if given the opportunity to move down to Florida, would you be able to? I was like, yeah, of course, you know. And but I've been in wrestling long enough to where like, I just I hear things. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. See until it, when it happens. You'll yeah, believe it when you see happens. it, right? Yeah, yeah. Until it happens, I'm like, yeah, okay. So then um, we're in catering after that. We're watching. We're watching Raw, and uh, we're in catering. And um, Eventually, they they approach me. They they come and they approach me about the about this whole thing because they had offered this spot to this other guy prior to me, and for whatever reason, he said he couldn't make it the next day. So then Jesse Hernandez goes, "Well, he speaks Spanish." So then they come up to me. They're like, "Hey, have you ever done ring announcing before?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." Which, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, they're like, um, "Do you have a tuxedo?" Which I again, I didn't. Um, yeah, I yeah, I got a tuxedo. Which, yeah, I was like, "Yeah, yeah dude, I'm broke. Um, I'm broke. I don't have a tux." So then I went to the Goodwill the next day and I bought a suit and you know some like cheap little things. Um, so I'm like, all right, go go to Bakersfield tomorrow for SmackDown and then we'll we'll talk there. I was like, cool. So then uh, I go to SmackDown and I'm nervous as hell because I'm not. I don't know what to expect. And then they they bring in Alberto and I don't I don't recognize him. I probably should have watched some WWE before I went in for the tryout and I still didn't because I, I I didn't see the vignettes I didn't know anything. Uh, the only time I saw that vignette was that Raw I think it was that Raw um, uh, where we were backstage watching Kerry so we we have to watch the product. Um, so then he comes up, we, you know, we, we introduce ourselves and whatever. And then they give me like a small little script and I'm nervous as hell. Uh, so I do my whole, the, the whole spiel. Cause I'm thinking re so I'm proper, you know, like I'm thinking, I think Justin Roberts, you know, pro- proper. And then Vince comes down and he has that walk. And I was like, oh my God, it's real. Um, the, the, the waddle is real. <laughs> uh, so then he comes and he's like, no, 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 be more animated. And then he goes, be more Hispanic. <laughs> fuck does that mean um so that in my head i'm thinking like the soccer announcers or i'm thinking like the triple a announcers so be louder that's what i'm thinking just be louder so then i go and i do the spiel he's like yeah be like you know that so then we do smackdown um i do the intro we go to the back i didn't hear anything so i'm just kind of sitting there um and then they come up to me again after that that night after and then they're like hey can you come tomorrow because they were doing a double taping. They're doing a Tuesday and Wednesday taping. Um, I was like, yeah, sure. So then I go uh, to Fresno the next day. I do the whole thing again. We get to the back, and then they pull me, and they pull uh, this guy named Alex Kozlov, who was in Ring of Honor. He was in New Japan, Triple H, Super Um, They pull us to the office, and they basically ask us, hey, are you guys on a contract? This and this. And I was like, no. They're like, um, they're like all right, we're going to uh, send you guys to... Um, get your physicals done and then we're gonna offer you guys contracts and then we're gonna send you guys to florida i was like oh fuck <laughs> this is this is all right so they offered me the contract on the spot and they're like hey can you are you available next week for for boston which is ironic um for for ron boston so i was like yeah of course so then uh, me and alex we go to the we, and i knew alex so we go to the back to the locker room 
And then they're like, hey, what happened? And then I just, I, I'm like, I don't, I'm, I don't know what to feel. And I'm like, we just got hired. And then that's when everybody's like, oh, shit, congratulations. Whatever, da, da, da. Um, that's unbelievable. Yeah. So I was like, holy fuck. That's, yeah, we just and you're like 24 years old this time, 24. right? Yeah, I was that's 24, insane. Yeah, I was 24. Well, so, so you have this journey with Del Rio and eventually they learn, okay, this guy can bump. And then your job becomes, you're going to do all these wild things. And, and yeah, basically, you know, I, I swear to you, I swear to you. Uh, and I kid you not, Michael Hayes, every single pay-per-view, he would always try to find a way to kill me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he would always in, in, in passing in passing whether it's at the airport or at the venue he would always tell me he's like you're gonna die next next month you're gonna die the pay-per-view we're, i don't know how but we're gonna figure something out fuck man um did you take that as a badge of honor oh yeah oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. of course yeah because i knew i knew it was gonna be a, like a, a high spot in a match um well so it makes me think of like tlc 2011 you're on that ladder and Miz and Punk tip yeah. you over through that table it's vicious yeah uh, it was it was fun I, I think of the time that Del Rio beat the living hell out of you with the bucket and and the <laughs> repos and I had a podcast at the time with my buddy Doug McDonald and uh we said from that point on any appearance by you was just the ghost of Ricardo Rodriguez because <laughs> we're dead at that point like it was it was unbelievable you're still a ghost I'm interviewing a ghost right yeah, now yeah, yeah, so yeah. I mean was that something that was a little difficult to come to terms with or did you embrace that no I embraced it um, I, almost immediately that, that I embraced because I, I like I said I knew it was gonna be a high spotter in the match um so I, I was I was cool with it there was one that that they they pulled the plug on and it wasn't my fault but it was scary as hell and i'm kind of glad they did uh it was i believe the hell in a cell with punk alberto and cena john cena yep uh yeah the the whole thing was what they were gonna do at the end or somewhere in the match where they were gonna all go to the top and then my dumb ass goes up there too and then i was gonna take the aa um uh, on, on top of the on top of the cage um so during rehearsal we're all up there right so we're up there and then i'm like i'm i'm telling michael hayes i was like hey man like i'm not afraid but i don't know if i can get up there because my dress shoes they don't fit in the fucking holes um uh at least not the ones that i had on like they don't they don't fit so anyway so we get up there and we're moving around and and my i'm they do it's high it's high as hell up there um so um, we're moving around and then something like a cable snapped. A cable snapped while we're up there and they pulled the plug on it right away. So yeah, that's the only one that, that didn't happen that I'm kind of glad it didn't happen, but then I regret it because I would have had an awesome highlight reel. Well, um, you know, Michael Hayes is kind of folklore here on Conrad Thompson's network, <laughs> doot, doot, doot. So hypothetically speaking, what would it sound like if Michael Hayes was asking you to take a crazy ass bump? Uh, I can't do I can't do his voice. I, I can't do his voice. But um, what? No, it wouldn't even ask him. He wouldn't. He wouldn't ask me. He would just tell me. Yeah. So no, hold on. That, that, hold on. He, no, he wouldn't ask me. He's like, uh, Ricardo, um, we're gonna you're gonna come the you're gonna come the ladder, and then they're gonna tip you over. And you're gonna fall on tables on the outside. All right. And then he go back and, and he talk to the guys. <laughs> <laughs> like okay all that's, right so I, I mean that's yeah it, it wouldn't ask me he wouldn't ask me would that's insane me. well uh one of my favorite moments from your run in wwe and when i told some people that i was gonna be talking to you for one one they're like you have to ask him about the 2012 royal rumble because for you and and you know i'm really big on the journey here on one-on-one -on -one, and that moment had to have it's not the culmination of your journey but it's definitely one of the climax pieces of your journey where you were a worker maybe not everyone knew that you embrace this role del rio gets hurt it catches a lot of fire and now you get your moment and it's in a comedy mm -hmm. role but you get your moment yeah. and, and everyone loved it what was that like when did you find out you were going to be in it and what was the reception to it when he got hurt i was afraid i was gonna be taken off tv as well um and, and, and injuries happen it, it happens as a fortunate uh, you know he's my brother so um so, so he's off. It's uh, like it happened. Like this, it was like December. It was right before Christmas. It was, I think it was like the raw before Christmas. Um, so I'm at home and I'm like, ah, fuck, this is gonna suck and blah, blah, blah. 
So then uh, we're doing FCW. We're doing FCW or NXT, yeah, FCW, FCW show. Uh, we finish and then it was customary for a bunch of us to go to this, um, to a restaurant after, you know, to go eat as, as it is. So then we go to a cheesecake factory actually. And um, as we walk in, I see Pat Patterson at the bar um, and he just happened to see us and everybody just kind of waved and walked off. And then I went over and then I just, you know, say hello da, 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 and I bought him a drink. And then, um, uh, so we're talking about, he's, he's like, Hey, you know, have you talked to Jose? And I'm like, yeah, you know, he's, he's fine. Da, da, da. Um, so then I, I, I was like, Hey, wouldn't it be funny if at the rumble, um, we play Alberto's music and then I come out and we have a, we have, we chuckle. Da, da, da. And that was it. That was it. Uh, fast forward to like, it was like a week or two later, we're at the airport and we're stuck there because of a storm and we're i want to say dallas i think it was dallas airport and i'm sitting next to dimo and um and he's again he's asking me about alberto he's like hey have we talked to jose i was like yeah he's fine there there. and there i go again it's like hey dean i I, I got a a question wouldn't it be funny if uh if you know at the rumble we play alberto's car or about music and i come out and again same thing we just ha 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 and we just talk about some stuff so then we go to st louis which is Day of the Rumble. We're in St. Louis. I'm by the ring because um, I I was um, I always like to be in the ring. Um, so I was by the ring, and then Michael Hayes comes up and he says next to me, and he's like, "Hey, did you see your car?" And I didn't know anything about it, so I'm like, "I'm thinking my rental car." I was like, "No, what what, what happened?" I'm thinking somebody like got hit it or so whatever. He's like, "Your car in the back. You didn't see it?" I was like, "No." So he's like, "Come here." So uh, he didn't tell me anything. So then we get right behind the the the, the time tron and I see a car, but it's covered. And then he grabs the, the 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 cover and he just lifts it. He's like, "Did you see a car?" I was like, "What the? What's that for?" He's like, "Nobody told you." I was like, "No." He's like, "You're in the rumble." He's like, "What?" <laughs> he's like, "Nah, fuck off, man." <laughs> what? Uh, he's like, "No, yeah, nobody told you." I was like, "No, man, like nobody told me." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you're in the rumble. This is your car." I was like, "Holy shit, this is going." That's when everything just kind of. You know, everything hit. Um, so then, yeah, so that, that's, I was like, oh man. So I texted my girlfriend right away you know, at the time. I was like, hey, guess what? You know, watch, watch the pay per view. Uh, I didn't tell her why. I was like, just watch the pay per view. So, uh, so yeah, so that was, that was, uh, that was, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. There's only been so many people that have been in the Royal Rumble. There, you know, only so many people can say they've competed in a Royal Rumble and, and got an elimination. And you got an elimination. Yeah. And everyone was loving it. They were loving life. And I just, I, I mean, I think that's such a cool little memory to have. And you worked yourself into a shoot. And that's basically, yeah, <laughs> that's, basically, that's so cool. And it's, but, but there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of issues, uh, not issues, uh, moments, um, instances where by me opening my mouth, like something happened. Like what um, else? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, like for instance, there was like a, a, a we did an intergender match. It was myself and Beth Phoenix against Layla and Santino. And beforehand, we they were going to do something where I was going to wear just like a super, super tight shirt. And Santino was going to rip off my shirt. And then um, they, they had some like really, it was like some weird little design on the shirt that they had at first. And I was like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I had like a like a, a Harry Potter or like a, a Britney Spears shirt or something? Um so they're like, oh yeah, yeah. So then they send like a runner to the store, and they they made them uh, they made them bring like a couple. They bought them a, uh, a couple of shirts. So then they gave me the Justin Bieber shirt. So that one I still get. I get hit on a uh, lot uh, about. Um, I get messages on Twitter about that a lot still. That's uh, but that's got to feel good that you made an impact, and that's what we're talking about nostalgia. Like people love looking back at the past. And it's crazy to think that this stuff is like in the past now and is nostalgic. Yeah, right. Is but it, it is and you made an impact and that has to be a really fulfilling feeling, especially as you take on so many different roles in your wrestling Mm -hmm. career now. What's what's I, I I guess like being in entertainment and then I know this is not just me and myself, but in wrestling, but in all forms of entertainment, I think we're all afraid of being forgotten Um, because we're so used to being in the spotlight and getting attention that when the light goes off, you know, like we're afraid of that nobody's gonna remember what we did or you know who we were, what we did. Um, I still get recognized, not a lot, but I still get recognized, and then that still warms my heart. Like it happened yesterday. I was wearing my face mask too. I was wearing my face mask and I had a hoodie on, 
And this uh, security guard passes by. He's like, hey, Ricardo? <laughs> I was like, oh. I was like, I was like, how, 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 how? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, it still, it still feels good. Yeah, and and now you've reinvented again. You're you're talking about reinventing as a trainer, and you've been doing a lot of commentary. You've done work with AEW. People forget, and, and I could be wrong here, but I'm not. I don't think I'm mistaken by saying you were on Spanish commentary when the streak was broken. Correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was a WrestleMania, WrestleMania Which thirty. Is- insane i mean that's something i'm sure you remember I, did you have any inkling that that was happening no. that was coming no 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 the only one that knew was uh uh carlos carlos carrera he's the only one that knew so when when the thing happened i thought that undertaker forgot to kick out uh that's what i thought happened and because they didn't play the music or anything um and then i was about to speak and then carlos just grabs my hand and then he, and i look at him and he's like I was like, oh, that's what you knew. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't know about it. But that was such a surreal moment because the whole arena, and, and I don't know if you were there. But I was like, there for that. It, it was insane. Went quiet. It went quiet. Uh, for for how of, of a big moment, like nobody reacted. Everybody just stayed quiet. Man, I've covered the NFL playoffs, the NBA playoffs. I, I've never experienced anything like that in my life uh, mm-hmm. in, in that moment. And so to have lent your voice to that is pretty insane. And that's just another thing. Yeah. And and now you're doing, you've done the work with AW and uh, you're, you're leaving an impact, man. And I think that's really cool. What do you want people to take away from your pro wrestling journey here? Um, for, for anybody that's ever allowed me to be a part of their life in, in any aspect, uh, as far as their, their career journey, I just want to say thank you. Um, like I said, for me, I feel it feels good when I see my influence in them, when I see them perform, um, when when they come up to me and they ask me for advice and then they actually, you know, take it into consideration and, and they do it. It feels nice. Um, so for me, I just kind of want to be remembered. I don't I don't I don't, don't want to say like praised what I feel for me. And this maybe this is me being egotistical. Um, I kind of see myself in, in a way, in a way, not, not fully, but in a sort of a way, like a Tesla, uh, like they collect Tesla. He did so many things, but he died poor, broken, and alone in his apartment, and he wasn't recognized for his work until many years later. Yeah. That, um, I'm not saying I'm going to die poor, broken, alone. I hope not. <laughs> but, uh, but that's kind of what I feel if I continue this path of what I'm doing internationally. That's what I feel is going to happen because if if India continues to to grow because now there's independence in, in India there's a whole, in, that's a big ass country uh, there's independence now they have TV there's so many different uh, options there now and it also because of what I did um, if I can build Egypt that's a major market that's a huge the Arabic market is massive and I don't think people realize how big that market is um, if I can build that then there's going to be a place for AEW to go, for WWE to go, for Impact to go, for whatever company eventually comes and you know, takes that you know, spot. Um, they have markets that are going to be available for them. So that's what I'm hoping to, to build the doors, open up the doors, basically. Well, and I know it's also been something that's been important to you about increasing positive representation, because so many yes. times, like, and then I'm not even just talking about Latino representation, but obviously Latino representation comes into the conversation here where there are stereotypes right like yeah we we know yeah. how latinos are stereotyped we know how yeah. uh middle eastern uh individuals are stereotyped in wrestling yeah. as the bad guy heals always right so yeah, 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 how do you how can you help contribute to breaking those stereotypes what i'm what i'm trying to do right now at, at the moment is um i i have representation in india as far as wrestling goes so i've already created that and, and I'm not saying I did it by myself because I didn't do it by myself. I had a lot of help. There was a lot of others that went after me. Um, there's a lot of guys that went after me. Ethan H.C., uh, uh, Daryl Sharma, who's a referee in, in WWE now, or NXT. Uh, um, uh, shoot, Facade is another guy that went. Um, there's a, a lot of guys that went after I did. Um, I have a guy right now that's going to, he's basically going to take over me eventually um, in Egypt because I have something else coming up. Um, so I'm going to start prepping him. His name is Anarco, Anarco Montaña. He's from Chile. So I'm going to have another Latino with me in, in Egypt for the next couple months until I you know, take off. Um, 
so so to, to like I said to 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 have those flags stamped in, in the world of wrestling to so that eventually it can make them grow and get them out of there to eventually come to the US to eventually have uh chances in in impact or, or in WWE or uh, uh AEW whatever it is um that is what that's my biggest pride so that's what I want so I want to build I want to build that reputation so that people realize hey there's wrestling in all these all these countries that we didn't know about um which wasn't there before but there is now and it's because I fucking started it um and I'm gonna have you know I'm gonna have people go after me of course but they're gonna you know keep it going um but that's what I want uh, I want to have representation in each country so you talked about making your answers full circle we just brought this whole interview full circle that's what we do here on one-on-one with John yeah, Albert yeah, yeah. I, I'm so appreciative of you stopping by and hanging out for the last hour with me your journey is so cool it's so unique and it just it shows that you you don't have to be a in-ring general to become a massive uh, fan favorite like pe- course, pe- yeah. people find your career so endearing and everyone plays a role in pro wrestling and you played your role perfectly and now you're changing roles and you're continuing to play whatever role you are starring in uh well and and i think that's really great where can people find you now and keep up with what you're doing so on Twitter, I'm still at RRWE. Uh, for the folks that keep bugging me about why don't I change my, my handle, it's because if I change my handle, I lose the check mark. Yep. So it's still at RRWE. So annoying. Uh, on, yeah. On Instagram, it's uh, at uh, the letter J underscore Rodriguez 818. And um, yeah, I was going to say pro wrestling tees, but yeah, we're scratching that. <laughs> You're on Cameo too, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm on Cameo as RRWE. Um, so you can, I, a buddy you can of want, mine, uh, personalized... a, a buddy of mine, yeah, bought yeah. a cameo from you uh, for me oh, uh, no. <laughs> about a year ago. Oh, so no way! And, oh yeah, I've, I've got it, and, and it was a blast. It was a total blast. Uh, Went shoot. all out for it. You were like at an airport in Egypt, and you're just like, "Yo!" I mean, it was great. It was so great. So I endorse it. I highly endorse it. Awesome. So awesome. yeah, uh, yeah. If you want a personalized cameo for your birthdays, bar mitzvahs, uh, uh, if you want me to announce the birth of your child. <laughs> uh, if you want to break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend, I'll do it too. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, man, I'm so appreciative of you hopping on one on one with John Alba here on adfreeshows.com. Don't forget, we get interviews every single week from all around pro wrestling, dropping every single Thursday at freeshows.com and AFS on youtube.com. He's Ricardo Rodriguez. Jesus, I really appreciate your time. We'll see you guys next time here on one on one.